Welcome to Corinth. So we're going to be spending two weeks in the city of Corinth with Paul. Uh, we're in the big story journeying with Paul as he joins God's mission to put things right in the world. Remember that we've been looking at the bigger story of the Bible. We've been looking at the story of the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation, from creation to new creation, from the garden to the new Jerusalem, the new city of God. And this spring, we're in the book of Acts. We're especially looking at the journeys of the Apostle Paul to learn what it means to live a gospel-centered lives on mission, on God's mission, together here in the city of Seattle. Last week, we were in uh, Acts 17. Today, we're in Acts 18. Why don't you open up your Bibles, and I'll read for us Acts 18, or pull it up on your device, on your phone. Acts 18, verse 1. After this, that was Paul up on the uh, Areopagus. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. I mentioned that last week. Every Sabbath, Paul would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, and I just love this, in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That's quite the exit. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was just next door to the synagogue. He didn't go far. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord, together with all his household, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. One night, the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you. For there are many in this city who are my people. So Paul stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. They said, this man is persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to the law. Now, just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of crime or serious villainy, I would be justified in accepting the complaint of you Jews. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourself. I do not wish to be a judge of these matters. And he dismissed them from the tribunal. So then all of them seized Sosthenes, the official of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of these things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as I mentioned, we're going to spend about two weeks uh, looking here at Paul's time in Corinth. So in your study guides, you've got um, readings from both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians that you're looking at. And this week, I want to take just a little bit longer to look on Paul's part in God's mission in the world. And next week, we're going to look at the cross and the reconciliation in Corinth. So last week, you remember, we were in Athens. This week, we're in Corinth. Uh, and I want to play a game, just sitting there at home, or if you're listening to this somewhere or watching it at another time, um, think of if you had to name the top five global cities, what would they be? If you had to name the top five global cities for influence, what would they be? Yeah? Some of you probably thought of New York. You may have thought of London. 
Maybe uh, Tokyo or Paris or, or Singapore? Did anybody come up with Singapore? I don't know if you know, every year since 2008, the Mori Memorial Foundation's Institute for Urban Strategies has analyzed the relative strengths and weaknesses of 44 of the world's best-known and best-loved cities. Their researchers look at the ability to attract capital and businesses and people. That's what they refer to as the city's magnetism. And they also scrutinize six other factors, you know, the economy, research and development, cultural interaction, livability, environment, and accessibility. And guess what? Seattle's not even on the list. So I like to tell myself that they just weren't one of the 44 that was considered. But the big five that you may expect were on there, London, Tokyo, New York, Paris, Singapore, Within the top 10, you're also going to see Amsterdam, Berlin, Seoul, Hong Kong. Shanghai actually made the list in 2020. Beijing dropped off of their list. Down in the top 100, if you keep going further, there will be cities like LA, San Francisco, Boston, DC, Chicago, even Vancouver, BC. And I'm not bringing this up to get into whether or not Seattle should be on this list, right? This isn't a sour grapes moment. But I just want to make a couple of observations. First, we have our large influential cities the same way that in the first century there were large influential cities in the ancient Near East, in the Mediterranean. And these cities do not just matter to the world, they matter to God. In the big story, as I mentioned earlier, it started in a garden, but it ends in a city. It ends in a city. Today, we're living at a time when 23% of the world's population is in cities, and these cities matter to God. And the second observation is cities were really central to Paul's mission. They were central to his strategy. He moved strategically between cities. And today's a good day to pause and look at that. Why am I raising that? Well, I've noticed over the course of this pandemic, there's kind of a love-hate relationship that's happening with Seattle. I bet we all have at least one friend who, like Paul in the synagogue, has shaken the dust off their feet and said, I'm out of this city. I'm just going. I'm certain you have other friends who have complained, who have said, okay, if I could move, I would move. I'm done here. I can't afford to live here, or I can't stand the politics, or I'm tired of being a person of color in this place, or I can't find a, you know, my job, I'm sick of this broken bridge. <laughs> I don't know, there's all sorts of things, right? I mean, just think for a minute how many complaints we hear about the city. But as a church, here we are. This is our city. And this city, whether or not it's made this cultural institute's list, does have enormous cultural impact. It was true in the case of Paul's ministry, and it's true today. Cities generate culture. They can be places that generate and, and send out destructive culture, and they can also be centers to generate and send out gospel culture. Today, one of the many churches in other cities in the world we can learn a lot from in this age that we're in economically, politically, culturally, globally is, um, uh, is from a church that's in a city in Kenya. And I'm going to come to that a little bit later in the sermon, so hang on to that. But the church that we're looking at in the city we're looking at today is the city of Corinth in the Bible. Paul had a gospel ministry in Corinth that, according to the, uh, the accusations in Thessalonica, turned the world upside down. It generated uh, a great deal of cultural change um, in, in these cities that Paul went to. And if you've been feeling like you're in this city that um, has all these different cultural things, but you're not quite sure you're fit, well, welcome to Corinth for Paul. Because in Paul's own mission of planting churches in gateway cities, Corinth was incredibly important and incredibly difficult. 
Let me give you a little history. Corinth was a large and significant city in the Greek Empire before the Greek Empire was captured, was overcome by the Roman Empire. And later it became the provincial capital of Greece. What we now call Greece was the province of Achaia in, um, in the Roman times, in the first century. It was on this trade route, route between Rome and the east, right? And it occupied a really important site for the sending out of the Christian gospel in all directions from this trade route. It also had a very cosmopolitan population and it had like commercial supremacy in the region. It was a city that was rich in history and wealth because of its geographic advantage. It was also a city of cultural diversity. It was a hub for Roman paganism. Idolatry is another word for that. And it was a hotbed for immorality. Now, the other thing about Corinth is it hosted, every other year, it hosted the Isthmian Games. And they just drew these throng, thongs of people, throngs of people from all across Greece. So, so Paul has chosen a city that is a meeting place for all of this stuff. And he shows up exhausted from Athens. We know that he's exhausted. We know that he, uh, this in part, because if you flip to 1 Corinthians, go ahead and, and uh, um, scroll down, scroll, flip across to 1 Corinthians in your device or go for it in your Bible. Look in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. This is what Paul writes. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words of wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Remember last week I talked about how the cross is absolutely central to Paul's proclamation of the gospel in every city he went to. Verse 3, And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul was just wiped out when he got to Corinth. And you can pick that up a little bit by the fact that this is the, that we're told that Jesus, you know, showed up to Paul in a vision to reassure him, to comfort him, that he wasn't alone in this city. And what we hear in this passage in, in Acts is that Paul spent 18 months here. What's interesting is the first time Luke tells us how long Paul stayed in a place. He really made Corinth a base. And that's fascinating to me because here's why. Corinth wasn't really Paul's people. It wasn't really naturally a, 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 a comfortable city for Paul. Antioch, that, that was Paul's city. That's where Paul based himself from. That was his home church. That's where uh, um, uh, Christians were first called Christians because it was a, a, a united multi-ethnic church with Jew and Greek together. Even Jerusalem was more of a home city for Paul. You know, culturally, religiously, they spoke his language. Those are his people. That's his city. Corinth, Corinth, he doesn't quite fit. So if you feel like you don't quite fit in Seattle, this isn't really my city. Culturally, religiously, I'm not sure if these are my people. Welcome to Corinth. You're going to love learning from the letter to the Corinthians and Paul's time in Corinth. Because the reality is whether or not it naturally, culturally, religiously or even, or even in terms of being able to find my people feels like our place, this is the place we are. And if we'll settle in, if we'll put down roots, if we'll look for opportunities, God has significant missionary opportunities for us, mission opportunities, ways to participate in his mission here in Seattle, just as he did for Paul in Corinth. Paul wrote several of his letters from the city of Corinth. The letters to the Thessalonians, most likely the letter to the Galatian churches. Um, on another time through the city of Corinth, he wrote his letter to Rome, his famous epistle to Rome. This became a really important hub of operations for Paul. And at the same time, this church just never quite worked for Paul. This is why we have two letters to the Corinthians. If something's going great in a church, they don't get a lot of letters. When something is a mess, there's a lot of letter writing back and forth. I tell you, two of the messiest of Paul's letters are 1st and 2nd Corinthians. As important as this city is and was to Paul, it was also, it was really tough. 
F.F. Bruce has suggested that he wonders whether or not Paul considered the, the church in Corinth as, as basically one of his failures, the church that could, he could never help them get their act quite together in this city. There was constant conflict and partisan disagreements. The Thessalonians believers uh, totally, whereas in, in Thessalonia, in Thessalonica, the believers struggled because they were living so distinctly different from the culture around them that they were persecuted. In Corinthians, in Corinth, they were living so much like everyone around them, they never quite figured out how to live this Christian thing, right? And you can tell it reading the letters. Corinth was known for its wealth and its commerce, and this is a church that struggled with the divide between the wealthy and the poor among the believers. Corinth is a city known for its paganism, and this is a church that totally struggled the entire time with idolatry. Corinth is a city known for its sense of sort of cultural supremacy and status. And this is a church that constantly struggled with status and power games in their congregation. It was a city known as a hotbed for immorality, and this is a church that constantly struggled with sexual immorality. It was known as a city that, that loved rhetoric. They loved their influencers, and the influencers in Corinth were people who could speak. Uh, right now, you know, we've got people on Instagram, right? In Corinth, it was the ones who could give these amazing speeches who just knew how to use rhetoric in the public square. The Corinthians loved this. And Paul was a lousy preacher. This really comes out in the letters to the Corinthians. The whole time, this is a church that struggled with its delight in what right now we would call the whole celebrity pastor syndrome, right? I mean, seriously, anything that Corinth was known for, the Corinthian church struggled with it. Because like I said, where the Thessalonians struggled because they were so distinct from culture, the Corinthians really struggled because they put literally no distinction between themselves and the surrounding culture. And this is a challenge. This is a challenge even now, right? How alike are we supposed to be just because we're curious and we're looking for common ground and, and we love the culture around us with our culture? And how distinct are we supposed to be? Well, the Corinthian letters are fantastic letters for finding out, all right, what's meant to be distinct? Paul writes them to the saints in Corinth. That's the word for holiness. Holiness is a life that shows that we wholly belong to the God in Jesus Christ, and that has some distinctions from everyone around us. So you'll see when you read these two letters at home over the next two weeks that, you know, these folks, they just divide over everything. Their favorite preacher, wealth and status, abuse and fellowship gathering, sexual infidelity, worship expectations, present of the spirit. At one point, they're so mad at Paul for confronting them about where they're out of line with the gospel that he's scared to even come face to face because it might go so poorly. So he sends Titus with a letter in his place. They resisted sharing their wealth with the poor in other cities. And just when it seemed in 2 Corinthians like everything might be okay again, here comes another round of celebrity preachers. Paul calls them super apostles. And once again, they're not quite sure that Paul is their guy. So Paul hits the ground in this city. He has to start over and over and over again, calling him back to faithfulness. I'll tell you, to be honest, I'm so relieved by the letters to the Corinthians because this is hard. It's hard to do this stuff in the church. It's hard to figure this stuff out. It's, it's, it's wearying, you know, hitting, hitting conflicts all the time in the wider church of God. Okay, when I'm talking about the church in Corinth, I'm not just, I'm Seattle, I'm not just talking about West Side, I'm talking about all the churches in Seattle. The church of God in Jesus Christ in Seattle. This gets wearisome. And so honestly, the letters to the Corinthians, they kind of make me feel oddly wonderful. <laughs> Because they secure my hope that God can do and accomplish really important things in his mission of making everything right in the world in super messy places. In places that even in a person's lifetime don't seem like they ever got their act together. God is up to something wonderful. And that's good news. It's really good news. Now, we're going to uh, go deeper into Corinth next week, and particularly status and the cross, but this week, I just want to make three simple observations, 
Okay? The first one I already started talking about, cities matter. Cities matter. They mattered on Paul's mission, and they matter to our mission. Even if they are not our home city, even if they are not a city that totally connects to us personally, culturally, religiously, socially, to our heritage, even if they are a city where it's incredibly demanding to live out a faithful gospel witness, even if the way that gospel witness looks is a constant source of struggle and negotiation, cities matter. And this city of Seattle matters to God. Now, if you're listening to this sermon or watching this sermon, maybe in another city, maybe, you are, maybe you're in Dallas or maybe you're in Paris or Bellingham or Spokane or some other city in Oregon where I know we have people who are joining us in worship. No matter which city we're in watching this, participating in worship today, pray for the city. This is the city God has put you in for a purpose for God's mission. Pray for the city. And even if you don't live in a city right now, pray for our city, okay? Pray for our city. Cities matter to God. Because just as much as cities can be an influence for harm in the world, they can also be a center for God sending out his gospel influence, his mission of restoration in the world. Let me come back to the city in Kenya I was going to tell you about earlier, uh, Nairobi, right? There was a church in Nairobi called Nairobi Chapel. It had grown very, very large. And so what they decided to do was divide, to split into five smaller congregations in the city. And they invited their congregation to choose one of these five places to worship in that was closest geographically to where they lived. This was in 2005. And one of these five churches uh, was a place that came to call themselves Mavuno. And in 2005, they started with about 400 people in that place. By 2015, they'd grown to over 4,000 and were continuing to grow. And, but when they started out, I think it's interesting, when they started out, they very much their story reminds me of the story of Paul and the way we know Paul worked in cities. Even though this was their home city, Nairobi, they decided to be curious. They wanted to know, why is it that young adults, millennials, are not joining the church? Why aren't we reaching them? What's going on? And they began by noticing that there was this gulf between a Christianity that was irrelevant to current social and cultural questions and a young adult demographic that really just didn't care about the questions that the church was asking. They also felt strongly, and, and I'm mentioning this on purpose because I think this is a good learning thing for us, they really felt strongly that the Christian TV and music that was being sent to them from America into Africa propagated a Christianity that, in the words of their founding pastor, was, quote, dangerously naive and mind-numbing towards local issues, close quote. And they decided if they were going to actually reach millennials, it was going to require a complete rethinking of how they communicated the message of the gospel, the medium of that communication, and the means, the methods they used to build community. So that's what they did. They just, they rethought it. They became missionaries in their own city. And not unlike Paul's curiosity in Athens last week, they began to study the lifestyle, the work habits, the entertainment, the communications, the relationships, the life patterns of post-college Nairobians. And when they did all this, they hammered out a mission statement. And their mission statement, I just love, it's this, turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. Turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. Now, mind you, they chose this mission statement before the term influencer became a big deal on uh, Instagram and things. Instagram and things. And as their fellowship grew uh, numerically, their vision also got bigger. Their vision grew into a vision to plant a culture-defining church in every capital city of Africa and gateway city in the world. You know, this church is sending missionaries to America. Now I have to tell you, their vision reminds me a lot of the Apostle Paul, of planting and cultivating 
churches in gateway cities. And I think we have a lot to learn from this church. Let me tell you one thing that I think is just delightful. One of the churches in America that ended up in a partnership with Muvano, Mavuno, I'm sorry, with Mavuno Church is actually Marinus Church in Irvine, California. I know about this church in Irvine because it's very near where my brother and sister-in-law live. It's in Orange County. It's not far from L.A. It's a mega church in Southern California. And uh, they turned around and decided, even though they were already a large church, to learn from what the Mavuno Church in Kenya had to teach us about the gospel in urban places. They developed their own discipleship program that was based on the one that was used and is still used in the Mavuno Church. They call this program Rooted. You're going to be hearing more about this in the sort of the weeks and the months to come here at Westside. And they even changed their own church mission statement. They were influenced by the one at the Mavuno Church. And their mission statement is transforming ordinary people into passionate followers of Jesus Christ, courageously shaping culture. Why am I telling you all this? Here's why. Because I believe we are called to a good work. Our good work is not going to look the same as other churches' good work in their city. But what is going to look the same is like Paul in Corinth and other cities that he visited. There is a call and a passion to establish a gatherings of believers who have a vision for God's mission in the world, who are gospel-centered and mission-focused. And these gospel-centered, mission-focused communities in cities are still called to participate in God's mission of restoring the world. We are called to a good work, to an important labor in this city, to live and to share the gospel of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this, this grace that transforms ordinary people into gospel influencers in, in every part of the city and the world. At another point in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved... Be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You know, this whole pandemic shutdown time has been very discouraging. It can feel like we're stalled. It can feel like we're kind of just marching in place until we get through to the other side of this thing. But that is not true. That isn't true. We have so many people in this congregation who have continued the labor in the Lord, and that labor isn't in vain. God is working out God's good mission among us in this time, in this place. It's fun to look and figure out what it continues to, to be like, continues to grow into, to continues, what continues to happen in God's good work among us here in the city in Seattle that he loves. Here's the second thing. First thing, cities matter to God. That includes this city. We are on mission in this city, especially those in our congregation or those who you know who don't, maybe just don't feel like Seattle is a, is a cultural home or a religiously safe place or even my people. You're here. You're here and God has a mission for all of us here together. Second thing, friends matter. Friends matter. First thing Paul does, what does he do? He looks for friends. Timothy and Silas are still back in Macedonia checking on the Thessalonians and the Bereans. Paul looks for friends. He's not a solo operator. He finds Priscilla and Aquila, who have also been kicked out of their city, right? Rome is their home city, and here they are in Corinth. And they're not just marking time in Corinth, just like we have not simply been marking time in the pandemic. They're looking for the mission that God has for them in the circumstances that they are in, in Corinth. And Priscilla and Aquila, they become such important friends and gospel partners to Paul. Even though we're used to thinking of Paul on solo, right? All of his letters make it clear. He always had friends. Jesus called disciples as friends to walk with him. When Jesus sent the disciples, he sent them two by two. When Paul went on mission, he went with friends. We need, we need to have close Christian friendships with other people who are curious and looking for God's mission in the world. 
I tell you, sometimes I feel like during this pandemic, I've just forgotten how to be a friend. You know what I mean? It's like we're used to kind of touching base with each other, but exercising those friendship muscles, those reaching out muscles, those making a new friend habits, we need to get those going again. Because at the same time, here in Seattle, uh, that we're looking for friends, there are people who are looking for friends. I remember when I moved back to Seattle, even though I was from here, this is a hard place to make new friends. It's a hard place to move into if you're from the outside. It's tricky to build new friendships. And all of us who are from Seattle, we kind of have this habit of we've kind of got our circle of friends we've had for a long time and we're happy with them and, and we just kind of live there, right? So if you haven't made any new friends during this pandemic, I want to challenge you, make a new friend. If you're someone checking out who Jesus is and you're not quite sure how to go about this, make friends with someone who's a Christian. You'll do them a favor. We do a lot better when we have friends who, who are asking questions about what we actually believe. What we found is people will check out a church and be interested. They might be interested in its preaching. They might be interested in its mission. They might be interested in its programs. But if they don't make any friends, they're not going to stay. They're not going to stay. We need authentic spiritual friendships, deep-hearted friendships. The way that Jesus comforted Paul in Corinth is he didn't say to, Cor to Paul in Corinth, hey, I'm going to do great things. Just be on the lookout and stay put. Remember what he said? In a vision, do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you. For there are many in this city who are my people. The other people in Corinth who befriended Paul were a sure sign, a tangible sign to him that Jesus had a purpose for him in that place. And so Jesus told him, look out for them. You may be being invited to be a tangible sign to somebody else that Jesus has a purpose for them in this place. Make a friend. Be a friend to others. We need spiritual friendships. God loves the city. Friendships matter. And last, you know what I mean? The cross is everything. That's clear from what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. Read it again if you didn't have a chance to read it yet in your study guide this week. You know, here's part of the challenge of cities. The cities are this mashup of people, of their places of, of every race and class and gender and social status. And in Corinth especially, people were really hungry for social status. And we're going to do a deep dive into that next week. But before we get there, the reminder I want to give us this week, in light of the cross of Jesus Christ, is the cross is a status changer. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. This is what Paul writes about uh, setting up this church initially in Corinth. He says this, Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Jesus Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's a quote from the prophet Jeremiah. What does it mean to boast in the New Testament and the Old Testament? To boast is to say, it's not just kind of crowing and saying, ha, 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 I'm, I'm great at this. Boasting is to put all my confidence, all my hope, all the reason that I'm not a waste of space in this world into something, right? And Paul's saying, put all of that into the Lord. Boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, I love Paul's writing, because guaranteed, you can tell this, reading these letters to the Corinthians, that more than a few people listening to this did actually think they were wise and strong and noble and powerful at the time of their conversion. So did you hear how Paul said this? This is what he wrote. This is just so smart. Not many of you were, and then he does his list, right? Which means every single person listening to this letter can think to themselves, 
Yeah, that's true. Not many were. I was one of the only ones, right? I mean, literally, everyone listening to this letter can kind of go, yeah, I'm pretty much the smartest person in the room. Everybody else here was pretty dumb at the point of conversion. I mean, Paul just catches everybody, right? And then he just takes it along and takes it along. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing, things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. When it comes to the gospel in a status-hungry, power-hungry, opinions saturated, status, conscience, urban center, the cross is an out-and-out race to the bottom where God chooses the foolish, the weak, the low, and the despised so that really is, there really is only one place to boast. And why is this good news? Because seriously, how much energy do you spend, do we spend, do I spend, and expand trying to come across as stronger or smarter or more competent or more put together or more emotionally stable or more important or more expected or more successful than we actually are? How much energy do we spend and expend on having something to demonstrate in this world? so that our lives are not, like I said earlier, a total waste of space. See, the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ is this, that the source of our life, God is the source of our life, and that life comes through Jesus Christ and the cross of Jesus Christ. The proof and the demonstration that you are not a waste of space in this world is the Son of God who loved you, and gave himself for you. Christ, the wisdom from God, the one who does get it all right, the one who is fully integrated and whole, the one who is entirely free, we can come to that cross and say, I do not have the energy to hold this together anymore. I can't keep up the appearances. I know I'm not smart enough or powerful enough or cool enough or admirable enough. I know that I haven't got my act all together and that I'm not free from all the stuff that snares me from, from without and from within. And I know full well that if everyone who criticizes me in my life actually knew everything there was to know about me, they'd have 10 times more reasons to be critical. This is just true of who we are. The cross is a gigantic ollie, ollie, and comfrey. Tim Keller has written, this is the good news of the cross. It alone can give us the humility, the humility that says, I have a lot to learn from this city. I have a lot to learn from these other people. It alone can give us confidence, the confidence that I have a lot, we have a lot to give to this city. And the cross alone can give us courage. I have nothing to fear from this city. Humility, confidence, and courage to join in God's mission that honors God and blesses others. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for your call on our life. Thank you that in all of our foolishness and our weakness, uh, you have redeemed us. You have come to forgive us, to make us whole. Thank you for the gift of friends to live out this gospel mission together. And thank you especially for this city and the messy, exciting, overwhelming challenge of living out the gospel in this place. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.